And welcome to my first Facebook Live. It's Luke Michael Howard here, aka the Hypno Punk, here live at 7 p.m. Eastern on a Wednesday evening. If you are watching, then please give me a thumbs up or a wave. However, however you do it here on um, Facebook. And how today basically works is you ask me questions and I answer them about hypnosis and change. Um, but why kind of the theme for today is going to be kind of talk about anxiety and some methods I use with clients to help them alleviate these symptoms or anxiety. Um, but certainly it doesn't have to just be based around anxiety. If you are out there, if you are watching, then please uh, do you make some comments in the comment, comment box so I can know uh, what your questions are. Uh, give me a wave or a thumbs up so I know that you're there. I'm not just speaking to myself, that people are uh, live and watching this because this is based on you. I also want to know if you can hear me okay because um, I'm using my handy dandy microphone here. This is the one that I use when I do my podcasts. And um, I think I'm going to use the mic because when I was using the audio as a little test earlier on, it didn't sound too amazing. So hopefully it sounds better with this mic. Um, I do not know. So if you could let me know, if you could hear me, that would be great. So, anxiety is what we're going to talk about here today. So I'm just going to wait to see if we have some people here and uh, listening. I'm going to let people uh, finish off the dinner and <laughs> come. Maybe you want to enjoy a beverage here at my hypnotist cup right here. Um, so, um, while we're waiting for people to come in, um, I also do screening calls. And basically what screening calls are is you and I spending about 30 to 40 minutes on the telephone discussing a subject in your life. Hey Deb, how are you doing? Thanks for the thumbs up. Deb is one of my favorite clients. She's amazing. She has uh, many, many transformations in her life. So it's good to see that she is there listening. If you can hear me, give me a thumbs up as well. If you hear me, give me a thumbs up so I know that you can hear me and this audio is working okay. Can you hear me okay? If you can give a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, so basically screening call, screening call, it's 40 minutes on the telephone with me. I'm going to turn down this light a little bit because I am waiting myself out here. All right, that's a bit better. Um, and uh, so all you need to do for screening call opportunity for you and I to speak on the telephone about something in your life that you want to improve, that you want to get better at. Thanks, Deb. You can hear me. That's great. Um, and we have a chat over the telephone, and then we basically see if I can help you. So if you're interested in receiving a screening call, it's totally free. Then there's a link right at the top of the screen. It says, go here to book your free screening call. It has a little tick, and then it has um, a URL one day. If you click on it, and you can book your screening call. You can see my schedule online and book the call there. It'll ask you some questions, and then we'll get on the, call, get on the call, get on the call, which is for me to say, and um, strategize some ways for you to... Um, improve your life and to get better so that being said um hypnosis and anxiety what is anxiety well anxiety is the same for everyone now there may be different triggers but it's the same for everyone here's how everyone in the universe not quite a globe it's my little retractable but we'll call this the universe does anxiety what they do is they go out to an event that hasn't happened because anxiety can only exist for things that haven't happened yet. Can't have anxiety for stuff in the past. You have to go out to the future. So something that hasn't happened, imagine it going shitty. If your kids are around, you may, I should warn you that sometimes the language may get a little bit colourful. So be warned, it's your responsibility to do this with your kids if they're around. Um, parental recommendations are advised. Um, but yeah, people can go out to the end of an event that hasn't happened yet, catastrophize it, imagine it going horribly wrong, fill their body with chemicals like um, adrenaline, fight, uh, flight, or freeze. It's okay, your screen didn't freeze, I was just miming it there. 
Um, uh, cortisol, which is a stress hormone as well. And that kind of codes that experience that hasn't happened yet deep into the neurology. And because you're unconscious, some people call it subconscious, doesn't know the difference between something that's real and something that's vividly imagined, it prepares that to happen for you. It prepares for the worst case scenario um, because it doesn't know the difference between something that's real and something that's vividly imagined. An example of this now, play along with me. As you imagine, imagine that you, uh, I had a lemon here. Imagine I had a beautiful, big, juicy lemon here right now. Just imagine it. If you imagine best by closing your eyes, then by all means, close your eyes. Imagine that I cut that lemon in half. As I cut that lemon in half, imagine that lemon juice squirting, squirting around, but don't get any in your eyes. Um, and then imagine you cut it again. To cut it into like four chunks of lemon. Imagine you were to pick up the juiciest, the most appetizing part of that lemon. You spray it to your mouth, you take a big bite out of it. And you imagine taking a big bite of it. Just imagine, just notice what happens in your mouth when you imagine now taking a bite of that lemon. For most people, pretty much everyone, if you did that right, it's way more wired. Is uh, the universal experience. When people imagine that, they start to have more saliva in their mouth. Um, so if you just think back to how much saliva you had before that little mind game to how much you have now, I'm imagining you have more now because your body doesn't know the difference. Your unconscious doesn't know the difference between something that's real and something that's vividly imagined as a chemical response in your body. I use that to, to demonstrate when you're rehearsing terrible things that haven't happened yet, going out into the future, catastrophizing, feeling shitty, your body figures it's real. So you see it inside your head, you feel it, and you have that chemical dump of adrenaline uh, and cortisol in your body. It's a bit like setting up that Google Maps inside your body from where you are now to where you don't want to go, but you practice that, unfortunately, which is anxiety feel. Your body's like, you're unconscious, and your body's like, oh, he, he wants that. He wants to feel anxious. I'll give him, I'll give him multiple opportunities to feel anxious. And I'll create situations in your life to feel anxious. That's how anxiety works. It's not real. I know it feels real. I'm not discounting that you don't feel it, and it feels very, very real in your body, and it's a shitty feeling to feel. I get that. But it's not real. And as I always tell my clients to tell them this if you are terrified of climbing a wall, you're like, hey, it's what rock in Australia, someone you're climbing a rock. And you are scared of falling off that rock face. That fear is only telling you one piece of useful information. And that is the thing that you fear isn't actually happening at this moment. Because if you were fucking falling off of Air's Rock in Australia, you wouldn't have a second to play that game of like, oh, what's going to happen? You wouldn't waste the thought. Because your body, your unconscious, your amygdala is literally ready, getting you ready to go flat to do the least amount of damage that's humanly possible. So you're not playing a, a game for a second of what can happen, what can happen here, what won't happen. So the very fact that you're feeling the fear or the anxiety, interchangeable sometimes, although you can have fear, things that have happened, but oftentimes when it's in the future, pretty much anxiety. Um, that's it. Yeah, you can't have uh, the very thing that you fear, the very thing that you're anxious about isn't actually happening. Another example of this is if you are scared of the big blue ocean, you're afraid of drowning. I take you out of my speedboat and I push you overboard and you're in the big blue ocean and you're fighting to keep your head above the water. You're kicking and you're screaming. Not for a second while you're in that water, you're thinking about drowning because you're not wasting a single thought for a single second. Now, you could have been scared five seconds before I kicked you in. When you remove from it later on, you could have fear when you replay the memory trace of it in your mind. But why are the things actually happening? You're in the moment. You're in the flow state. So the one thing that anxiety tells us is one piece of useful information, only one piece of useful information, is the thing that you're scared of ain't actually happening right now. It could. could happen. Equally, it could not happen. But it ain't happening right now. So it's actually a good thing. If you're scared about something, if you feel anxious about something, it means one thing. The thing that you're scared about, the thing you're anxious about, ain't actually happening right now. I remember when I was younger, when I was at school, I went through a lot of bullying. I was bullied a lot. 
and I'd be terrified of physical, physical, physical confrontation, believe it or not. So I spend most of my time strategizing ways to avoid certain boys at my school. It became a job for me, part-time job, maybe a full-time job. I was terrified, I was terrified of getting beaten up. I was terrified of being ridiculed and humiliated and all that shitty stuff. And then one day it got to a point where I couldn't run. I couldn't talk my way out of it. I couldn't run away. It was just literally my back against the wall, like that wall right there. Um, and I had to fight. I had to protect myself. Um, my amygdala thought I was you know, going to die. So I had to protect myself. There was no way out. And in that moment was the first time I wasn't scared. When I was in the fight, when I was protecting myself, when I was doing what I needed to do, it was that first time. I wasn't scared of fighting. It's the first time. Because my amygdala, my unconscious, didn't have a second to be scared. Just making me put up my hands, protect myself, get out of this hole, get out of that, this hole, get out of that, to protect myself. As I make this light a little bit thinner. There you go. It's all about lighting, folks. So that was what I learned about this. Oftentimes, the thing we're scared of isn't actually happening. And if it was happening, we wouldn't be scared. We'd just be putting out the fire that's actually going on in the moment. So you feeling anxiety or fear tells us one piece of useful information. The thing that you're scared of isn't actually happening at this particular moment, which is a good thing. If anyone else is out there other than Deb, <laughs> please give a thumbs up. Let me know that you are listening. Any questions, please type in on your, uh, on your phone, on your device on your PC let me know what you want to talk about otherwise I'm going to on a tangent that anxiety here to stay so here's um typically how people get traumatized from like post-traumatic stress disorder PTSD is we're walking down the street hypothetically all right walking down the street and there's a big bang so my cat just jumps then this is your amygdala and it's doing this the whole time and then one day you're in a big bang pool amygdala expands and goes shit Am I in danger? Do I have my arms? Do I have my legs? Do I have both my eyes? My beautiful beard still here? Oh yes, Luke was just being a jerk. He was clapping his ass again and making a loud sound. I'm safe. Everything's okay. Immediately goes back to do its normal job. That's what happens in most of us that don't have a trauma or don't have a post-traumatic stress disorder. Another version of this is you are crossing the road. You are crossing the road and suddenly a car comes out of nowhere and you jump back. Jump back, she don't get hit by that car. You didn't know the car was coming. Your amygdala, your, uh, your unconscious, your reptilian brain, however you want to call it, it pulled you out of there. It knew to keep you safe because it's number one job. It's not to keep you happy, folks. It's to keep you alive. So your amygdala figures, oh, shit. Your reptilian brain figures, oh, shit, I'm about to die. It expands. Then you realize, oh, you know, some jerk that ran a green light. I am safe. I did not get hit by the car. I've got still my two arms. My two legs, my two eyes, my two ears. I can breathe now. Eric's okay. And immediately goes back to doing its normal thing. This is life. Happens every day. The problem becomes when something triggers off the amygdala, some kind of trauma, some kind of bad experience. It could be a big experience. It could be a small experience. It could be someone giving you a nasty look, saying a mean thing to you. It could be someone beating you up. Could be anything in between that. What happens then is the amygdala gets fired before it gets an opportunity to shut down. A bunch of these characters get in there. If you're familiar with Disney, it's a product placement right now. No, they're not funding this. They're not sponsoring this from movie inside out. Sadness. Emotions get trapped in there before it starts to close down. Anxiety is another one. So anxiety. He might get in there before it gets to fire, fire down. We've got um, shame. Shame might get in there. Another emotion. But some of these emotions are going to resonate more than the others. So when your middle goes to fire down, it can't shut all the way down because all these characters, these negative emotions are in there. So you can do all the talk therapy you want, you can take all the medication you want, read all the self-help books you want, but as long as that shit, technical work, it's still in there, you're still going to have problems. So my job to do as the change worker or the hypnotist is to lovingly kick the hornet's nest to do this to your little bit, to open up that amygdala, 
and then to lovingly shake it. So those characters, even that one at sea, she's still stuck in it. It's a shame. She doesn't want to go. Until she disappears, she falls out. So the amygdala can go back to how it once was. And it's kind of pretty much the work that I do uh, as a change worker with people. And anxiety, here's the thing. Anxiety of all the emotions, it's 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 pretty fucking useless because it makes people feel shitty. It's the number one reason people come to see me nowadays actually is for anxiety, general anxiety, specific anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, every type of anxiety that you can imagine. It's shitty, it holds them hostage, makes people be a prisoner. So basically when I do change work with people, it's about taking that charge out of it. So it doesn't mean that you're never able to access that emotion again in the future, but you'll be able to access it for real reasons. I.e., back in the day of evolution, we saw a lion or a tiger in this room, and I have a tiger in this room, but she doesn't want to go on camera today. And I have uh, Mr. Beast, but a bit like a lion as well, but they're a bit camera shy today. But back in the old days, if there's a saber toothed tiger in the middle of the room, let me see if she comes. Tiger, come on, tiger, tiger. She might come in a minute, or she might be a bit shy. <laughs> she's coming, she's coming first. Get ready for the cameo right now. Three, two, one. She comes. See when I call her, she comes. Now, if if if, if, if Tiger was about 400 pounds heavier, she would eat me. And she had that saber tooth. If you imagine back to evolutionary days, then we'd have a shot. A reptilian brain would go off and be like, oh my God, there is this big monster there. It's going to eat me. I've got to get the fuck out of there. And you'd run away. She's not a monster. She just loves attention. She's in attention at all. Um, but in today's society, we may have little cats that come and want to play with us like this, but we don't have a lot of life or death situations in our normal everyday life. We don't have a lot of saber tooth tigers. Yes, I know. You're on camera. Say hi to the Facebook audience. There she is. But I give her too much love. She shits on the floor in the morning. It's not good, even when we change. Her litter, she still does it. Not good. But in modern day society, we're not always trying to run away from a saber toothed tigers. So um, we don't need to have um, this heightened sense of readiness because we're not, for most of us, we're not in dangerous situations. Yet our amygdala thinks we're still in dangerous situations, traps us with these emotions. So at some unconscious level, some reptilian brain shit going on, we still think we're going to get eaten by lions, tigers, or bears. You're not. You know that logically. That reptilian mind, that mind that's been there for literally um, millions of years, doesn't know that. So hypnosis oftentimes is about taking out that charge. Not just intellectually, through talking, through counselling, because you can just talk to a friend and your problem will disappear. But Typically, it doesn't. How's that working out for you? Just talking about your problems. Did you disappear? Most of the time, no, it doesn't. Because we have to get rid of the charge. Sometimes get rid of the charge by many different ways. Um, the longer I've been doing change work with people, and this is year 21, um, one of my big things now is getting people to feel, feel shit. I uh, used to dissociate a lot in my own life. What that means is not feel things, good things and bad things. It would mean that when I visualize and close my eyes, I'd see myself in the picture as if I was watching a movie or watching or seeing a still photo, but I wouldn't be in it looking through my own eyes, seeing stuff, which then um, I dissociate. I didn't feel the richness or the juice or the joy from a lot of good experiences in life. And it also protected me because everything we do, every pattern we do, there's a protective mechanism because I didn't want to feel hurt. I had a lot of hurt in my life. didn't want to feel anymore. I didn't want to feel sadness. I didn't want to feel sad. Just because I get a shitload done when I'm anxious or angry. When I'm sad, I ain't that productive. When I'm hurt, I forget about it. So I avoid most feelings. I avoid the shitty feelings. I'd also avoid a lot of good feelings like joy and fucking happiness and bliss. And it, the, 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 the root or the door to get to those beautiful feelings that we want to feel more happiness, more bliss, more connectiveness and all that good stuff is you've got to go through bad emotions. There is no real bad emotions. Every emotion serves its purpose. The more and more work I do with people, more and more work I do with myself is to allow people in a safe way to feel whatever the fuck they need to feel for as long as they need to feel it. 
so then it can pass like an onion, like the uh, like the matrix. So it can pass because your feelings come, so they can go. Your feelings come, so they can pass. So if you try and avoid them, and we we avoid our feeling feelings many different ways. I know I used to watch too much TV, play too many video games, have too much sex, watch too much porn, eat too much, drink too much, do too many drugs. Go on the internet too much, go on social media too much. Most of the time it's because we're avoiding, we're avoiding doing stuff, we're avoiding feeling. Avoiding feeling. I used to avoid feeling all the time. So now a lot of my own personal change work, I'm always working on myself. And we work with clients, is learning to be brave, putting them in a safe environment where they can feel whatever they need to feel. And sometimes this is some shitty feelings. It could be sadness, it could be hurt, stuff we don't want to feel, loneliness, being scared, being frightened. And not to put, not to be mean, not to torture, not to keep them there. So we're going to keep you there, but no emotion lasts forever. And the more that I would face my own negative emotions, stuff like hurt, um, stuff like sadness, that I try and avoid and push it down like a jack in the box. But then at four o'clock in the morning, when I couldn't sleep, jack in the box would open up and say, hey, no, it's me. I'm all of your pain and here I am and I'm not going to let you sleep. And I'm trying to avoid it so I didn't want to feel it. But when you kind of reach back, you grab that demon, uh, you put that demon in front of you of that emotion you don't want to feel, whether that's hurt, whether that's sadness, loneliness, whatever it is, and you sit with it. You sit with it. And you feel it. Scary as it may be, understand it. It's going to end at some point. It has to. No emotion lasts forever. Probably won't, probably won't last a couple of minutes, but you just sit with it. You're like... All right, I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to sit with you. I'm not going to disregard you. I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to feel you. I'm not going to try and change you. I'm going to let you emote over me. The weirdest thing happens, that big scary monster that I was running through or from for most of my life, as soon as I gave it permission to feel, give myself permission to feel and felt it, that thing that I've been running from 10, 20, 30 some years would go in less than five minutes and it might come back but come back less it might come back again less intensity it might come back in less intensity stick around less and less time with less and less intensity so one of the moral of the story is fucking feel folks feel do stuff in your body it's why i have fucking cold showers Some videos coming on that soon cold fucking showers why do i have cold showers i want to feel I have a lot of the same challenges as you do. I live my fucking life in my head. I'm working to get more in my body. So I do things like cold showers, because guess what? When I'm fucking in minus 20 degree water, if that's the actual um, way to class it, um, it's fucking cold. I'm not thinking, I'm just feeling at that point. When I do ice baths, I'm feeling something. When I go to massage now, I go there and they work on a knot like around my neck or something. Instead of kind of like oh, shirking away from it or going off somewhere else or being distracted, I focus on that knot and I fucking feel it. Not because I'm a masochist, but I realize that to get these good feelings, you've got to be open to feeling some of these bad things. And they're not bad, but you've got to feel them. That's what I do. It's why my meditations that I do now, I hold my breath sometimes for up to five minutes. Um, because it takes me from here, just spend most of my time, puts me in my body to feeling something. I don't just necessarily mean emotion, although sometimes it will be emotion, but I mean semantically, um, like a body sensation. When you're feeling body sensations, if you look at the work of Eckhart Tolle and the power of now, it's one of the only, one of the big markers that you're in the moment. Because you can think about, if you're thinking about stuff that happened a minute ago, you're living in the past. You're thinking about stuff and probably sadness there. If you're thinking about stuff that you're going to do in the future, you're living in the future and there's probably going to be some anxiety there. We talked about that a little bit earlier on. One of the best ways to live in the moment is get out of here, get more into it here, and start to do physical things. Start to really get into your body when you're working out. Maybe don't listen to music. Maybe just focus on the muscle that you're working when you're working out. When a feeling comes up, feel it. If you're feeling some physical pain, feel the physical pain. Oftentimes when I have clients that feel physical pain, I tell them to feel it. Like, I'm coming to you, I'm paying you all this money, you're going to tell me to feel my pain? What the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, feel it. 
And when I get them to actually feel that pain that they're claiming is an eight, a nine, a 10 out of 10, then suddenly they're like, I get them to feel it, just feel it, to be in that moment, to not escape it, not five minutes in the past, not um, an hour into the future, be in that moment, feeling that back pain, that shoulder pain, whatever it is. Which thing happens? Oftentimes that pain will be a seven, or eight, or a nine, or a 10, just by getting to focus on it, will just go down to a three or a four. Just by focus on it. You, you think by focus on it would make it bigger. It actually starts to, um, it takes away the bad sensation from it. You still got a feeling there. But it starts to have, a, have, a, have an adverse effect to the pain, which is good. You want to have an adverse effect to the pain if you're in pain. Just by focus on it. Focus on the feelings, the sensations, rather than run from them. Because every feeling, every sensation that you have is trying to teach you something. Like a little kid, you're the parent, it's pulling on your apron string saying, Daddy, Daddy, no, it's me. Like Tiger was hitting me, tapping me, but that thing earlier on. And you give her attention, you give that kid attention. That's all they want. They want love. They want to be heard. They want to be understood. Once, oftentimes when you give them that hearing, that understanding, just being in the moment with them, they go away. Pain's a bit like that. Anxiety's a bit like that. When you acknowledge it, you don't have a victim story of, oh, oh, I'm anxious because the world is a terrible, scary, bad place. Oh, I've got this back pain because I was in a car crash 30 years ago. And even though my body is renewed, if you look at the work of Deepak Chopra, even though my whole body is renewed probably at least 10 to 15 times over the last 30 years, so I don't have the same back that I did have 30 years ago when I was in the accident, I still have this pain. So now it becomes an interesting thing. If your body... And I can't remember the exact stats, but it comes from the work of Deepak Chopra. Um, but essentially, the body you have now is a completely different body, as in cells, as in skin, as in uh, DNA, uh, the very molecules that you are. It's completely 100% different body that you inhabit now than you did a year or a year and a half ago. Um, you can find the exact stats on this, but something like the liver renews all the cells in the liver. Something along the lines of they, they all die within about six, six weeks, 12 weeks, and they're respawned. So the liver that you have now is not the same liver that you had approximately 12 weeks ago. I think your heart is renewed essentially every six months or so. So the cells in the heart completely die. The tissue completely dies, and it's respawned by a uh, new tissue, new cells. So the heart that you have now um, is not the same heart that you had six months ago. Your skin, I think all of your skin is literally renew renewed. I uh, think every 12 weeks you completely have completely new skin. It may be less than that. Um, and your whole skeletal structure, that's replaced completely renewed, as in all the cells completely die. Uh, and respawn with, with newer cells, I think a skeletal structure is a year or a year and a half. So basically, uh, the body that you're in right now is not the same body that you had a year and a half ago. I mean, it really isn't. I mean, you may look the same or somewhat the same, um, but it's completely different. That's what becomes interesting where people had accidents over a year and a half ago and they're doing what they need to do to, to rehabilitate while they still have pains and ailments. And if you look at the work of uh, Dr. Sano, I believe last year, a uh, legendary doctor, and I want to say in Mount Sinai or Bellevue in New York City, uh, but he was a medical surgeon, a legit surgeon, not a quack. He would operate on people's backs for many, many years. I mean, his career was like 30 years. And he realized there was a mind-body connection. You can look up his work. His most famous book, his seminal book, is uh, called Healing Back Pain. It came out in a like, much in 80, Healing Back Pain. Dr. Sano. And basically, to a point in his career, we stopped doing surgery with people and he just did uh, therapy. He called, called it hypnosis, whatever. It was kind of hypnosis and visualization, but I think he called it something different. And he would do this. It's kind of detailed in his book, uh, Healing Back Pain. And, and again, this the philosophy could be used for any uh, degenerative or chronic pain, meaning stuff that you've had for more than three months and ain't going away. And he would just literally do therapy, talk therapy, visualization, hypnosis, whatever you want to do it. He wouldn't do um, um, surgery with people anymore. And the success rate of him healing people uh, was, was some crazy, like 80, 90% of people that would come in would need back surgeries. He'd spend a few hours with them or he'd train people 
he literally trained people, other people to do these seminars for him in other countries. People would come into like a two or four hour seminar. He got like a hundred people in the room, like eighty percent of these people's back pain disappeared. Not because they were claiming to be some kind of shaman or something like that, or snake oil salesman. Um, it was just basically using your brain better. Realizing oftentimes when I get clients come see me and they're in physical pain, uh, and it's again chronic pain. I, if someone was hit by a car, I would immediately advise they go to surgery immediately and get themselves checked out. But I'm talking chronic pain, chronic pain, pain that's been around for at least three months. They'll come in and I'll be like, hey, wh wh where's your pain now? On a scale of zero to 10, 10 is like through shame pain, zero is nothing. Where's that like right now? Look, Luke, when I got up this morning, it was no, no, no. Where is it right now? Oh, Luke, I know when I go home and I have to walk up that stairs, it'll be, no, 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 where's your pain right now? And they'll stop and they'll do this in their eyes. We call it neuro linguistic programming, transcendental search. You're looking at all the quadrants of their eyes and they'll come back and they'll be like, oh, Probably like a three out of 10. Within 30 seconds, by taking out all of his, the historical pain, this morning, whenever, the uh, future pain of what happens when I go to the gym later or climb up those stairs, by taking out those two legs of the chair, so to speak, and just focusing on that moment, would literally take away two thirds of someone's pain. It's something you can do for yourself if you, uh, unfortunately, do experience any chronic pain in your own body. But hey, I see that Tara has joined us. How you doing, Tara? If you can hear me, give me that thumbs up thing so I know that you can hear me. And my voice is coming out there loudly because I've got my microphone plugged in and I don't know if you can hear me. Hopefully you do hear me. If you can hear me, give me that thumbs up. Also, if you've got any questions, Tara, I'm talking a bit about anxiety and pain right now, but please, little comment section, ask some questions. That hypnosis Anything, any questions you've got about hypnosis or change work or, or my work please please put them in that little box and I will be delighted to answer them for you my first Facebook live we'll see how this this modality works um, yeah so that's anxiety it's a little bit of pain somebody wanted me to cover some stuff on uh, addictions today so a lot of my work now my number one the number one reason people come see me now it's anxiety uh, number two is some form of addictions whether that be sugar whether that be alcohol whether that be crack whether that be meth and fat and everything in between many different types of addictions um, and the thing about addictions is this all addictions you know what the um, the opposite of an addiction is it's not sobriety a lot of people think well the opposite of being addicted to something is sobriety not doing it the opposite of an addiction is connection because people are truly addicted to something, they've lost connections with people, with family members, with good people. They've lost a connection with themselves. The opposite of an addiction is connection. Um, you can find the exact stats on this online. I'm going to butcher it, but I'm going to give you the bird's eye view. In the 1960s, in the Vietnam War, uh, American soldiers for the first time were introduced to heroin. In Vietnam. And we're told that other than crystal meth, heroin's just about the worst drug you could ever possibly be addicted to. It's the worst one and it has horrible withdrawals. We're told this, right? There's rehab centers all around the world now, you know? In Toronto, we've got uh, Cami, K M A H, uh, the uh, Center for uh, Mental uh, Illness and Addictions. Anyways, we're told. The heroin's the worst addiction. It's a really bad one to uh, to kick. So back to the uh, Vietnam War. The uh, American soldiers were first introduced to heroin. So what happened is that a huge percentage of these American soldiers were using heroin first time. So they, they didn't have rehab centers back then in the 60s. They certainly didn't understand like how, what heroin was and just how toxic it was and how bad it was. But in their ignorance, they had actually great power their ignorance to this subject, they had great power. Because what would happen is these American soldiers that would go back to America after the war, and they would go back to their family unit, be back with their friends and stuff, there would there'd be no rehab because those rehab centers didn't exist and they didn't know the severity of, um, of heroin back then. 
But when I went back to the family, when I went back to a safe environment, something along the lines of 70 to 80% of those soldiers that were taking heroin, that would have been classed addicted to heroin, never used again. Didn't have any withdrawal symptoms whatsoever. They just stopped when they went home. As soon as they were taken from that horrible, horrendous war environment of um, the Vietnam War, and they were put back in a safe environment in their country, with their friends, with their family, with their loved ones. Um, 70 to 80% of them are just self-corrected, not replacing it with another toxic drug. They were just put back in, a, in an environment, of, again, friend, family and friend, a safe environment, and they stopped, they stopped using whole turkey. So an interesting thing is, whenever I get a client who is... Um, I like to get clients, if they are, do have some kind of addiction, I like to get them before they go to rehab. Because statistically, this might blow your mind, statistically, when somebody goes into rehab, across the board, for whatever the problem is, it could be cigarettes, it could be heroin, crystal meth, alcohol. When someone goes into rehab, statistically, their odds of overcoming that drug drop drastically. Uh, yeah, you heard that right. When they go to rehab, their odds of getting well drop drastically. I'm not making this shit up. You can read the stats um, out there. It's fucking crazy. So if I hear a client that's been in rehab for a drug, I'm like, ah, shit, we've got a job. We've got a tough job ahead of us. If I hear they've gone into rehab three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I'm like, fuck. This is going to be really, really, really tough. I had a gentleman, and I won't share his name, not betraying his confidence, come to see me. And he's addicted to um, crystal meth, methamphetamines uh, that got leaked into porn in some way. Um, but he said, Luke, um, I've, I've, I'm going to Camille, the uh, mental health and drug addiction thing here in uh, Toronto. But there's like a two year waiting list. I need to do something now. I can't wait for two years. I'm like, thank God, to the atheist. Thank God that we get you now. Because then I told him, if we'd got you after that you'd gone to uh, rehab, the odds of us being successful, you being successful on any level, are going to drop drastically. So that I have an opportunity to come and work with you and help you to correct this in yourself now. It's actually a really good thing. And again, without betraying any confidence or saying his name, um, he's now gone a month. He's now gone a month without any meth and fat of mines, uh, without any porn. Um, which is uh, which is amazing. Deb asks, why does it decrease after rehab? Uh, okay, so I don't have the stats in front of me, but basically, if memory serves me right, what happens, it's a bit like when somebody commits a crime, let's say you commit a petty crime, like petty theft, you went to a Walmart and you stole a box of cereal, and then they put you in prison with rapists, with murderers, with serial killers, with child molesters, with gang members, with KKK members, with bikers. And you went in there and you did this little crime and now suddenly you're exposed to all of these monsters. Sometimes we have to be like this. You've got your own monster you're dealing with. And then suddenly you're put in an environment where everyone around you has this drug. And you're not putting an environment around people that have overcome the drug. You're putting an environment with people that have been there multiple times and failed. So that whole environment where you're incredibly suggestible already, because you're in a different environment, fight or flight has been activated, you're not sure if you're safe, the drug's been taken away, your comfort, you're around other people that are going through withdrawals at this time as well. You hear in their stories in group therapy, day after day after day, all the times that they've failed. So my thing is, if I was doing rehab, what I would do is I would get 50 people that overcome their drug, their affliction, and they'd overcome it for over 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Like Elton John, I know you're a big fan of Elton John, Debbie. I've read something about him being um, alcohol-free for 29 years now, as a touch the sip of alcohol in 29 years. But what I would do is my rehab would be filled with people that have been clean and are happy and living a successful life for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And those people would be in a room. That, that newer person who's just overcoming their drug is now going to be by osmosis around a bunch of people that overcame it successfully. Not just for a day, 
but for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, they've come out the other end. And then, you know, you're basically going to kind of default. Melanie, Melanie Germain, the Hypno Pixie has joined us right now. So that's what I would do. That's what I would do with rehabs, I guess, for people to test the order, kick their drug, and um, put them together so they could by osmosis help people kick their drug as well. But there's nothing worse than being in a room full of people bitching and complaining about why their life is shitty, getting stuck in their own story of why they can't change, having this one next to you and this one next to you, yeah, reinforce you, and now your whole social circle, because remember addiction is about a lack of connection in your life, now you're getting a connection with all these other people around you that are bitching and complaining about why they can't get over the drug, you're getting a connection, Matt. But it's a toxic connection. It's a toxic connection. Now you've now you replaced that family unit or that drug with a bunch of people that said they could never overcome it. Oh yeah, I've got all those lovely shocked faces and smiley faces. Um, so yeah, that that would that would be my theory on it. But there there are some stats on it. Um, I've got them somewhere. I got it from a training I did with Melissa Tears last year on addiction. She's a very famous um, New York hypnotist. Um, yeah, anyone else got any questions about any of that? We kind of covered a little bit about addictions just then. Uh, talked a little bit about chronic pain. We talked a little bit about anxiety. Um, anything else that you folks would like me to talk about while you have me here? You can just type into your little Google machine right here and ask some questions. While I'm waiting on those questions, don't all jump in at once. Um, probably the, the third or fourth biggest reason people come and see me is they want to do some form of weight loss. I'll call it weight release, but from time to time I'll call it weight loss. But we never really like to lose anything, right? We don't want to lose our rings. Certainly I don't. I don't lose my beard. Although I have these nightmares sometimes that I've lost my beard. It's been cut off and I wake up and I'm sad and I realize my beautiful life's beard is still here and I feel happy. Give yourself a low expectation to feel happy, by the way. Um, sometimes, like, if I win the lottery, if I get a supermodel, if I have a million dollars in the bank, if I have a six pack, not beer, then I'll be happy. Fuck that shit. Why don't you be happy now? And then you can get that stuff if you want. If you think it's going to make you happy, it doesn't. I had most of that stuff. It didn't make me happy. I had no stuff. No, just the same. We think all these things are going to make us happy. When I was the leanest, the sexiest, had the most amount of money, most amount of women in my life, I wasn't any happier than when I had none of that stuff. I told my thought in my head I would be, but I wasn't. I need to do some more work on my inner self. Anyways, I digress. Weight, release. We don't, we don't want to lose things. But from time to time, because I had 40 years of saying weight loss, I'm going to say it. Um, our unconscious doesn't like to lose things. It likes to release things. It likes to release when we go to the bathroom. It likes to release when we get in a massage. There's tension that we might have of those knots. We like to release things, our unconscious. We don't like to lose things. So I do weight release with people. And every person I've ever met, including my good self, every reason they had uh, for overeating or being overweight had nothing to do with... Uh, well, it did have to do with the biomechanics of what they were doing, but it was some wound that hadn't been healed inside. So they could be on the best diet, could be on a keto diet, could be trained every day. If you don't address those issues inside, you might lose some weight. But the likelihood of gaining it back is going to be very, very high because you've kind of put in a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. The kind of work I do with people, when they go in there, they're going to fucking pull out that bullet. It's not there anymore. You're not septic anymore. And then we can sew you up. So that reoccurring vicious cycle of gaining 10 pounds, losing 10 pounds, gaining 20 pounds, losing 20 pounds, gaining 50 pounds, if you're like me in the past, losing 50 pounds and gaining 50 pounds, um, breaking that cycle down, some healing. And all eating problems are emotional eating and are some kind of trauma. Again, trauma doesn't have to be the end of the world, folks. It's just be some stupid suggestions from some people that perhaps were well-meaning, like parents growing up, or it could be a bigger, bigger trauma in your life. A trauma doesn't have to be the end of the world. It could be small, but when we're small, we hear things over and over again. It's hypnosis. It becomes suggestions. Um, and if you were like I were in the past, uh, we I used to eat my feelings too much. What do they say? Um, what do they say? Like one one donut is too much, but twenty thousand is not enough. It's kind of like that. Uh, but the kind of work I do when it comes to weight releasing people is yes, yeah, speed up their metabolism. Um, you, you, Using some idiomotor responses, 
that's just basically a posh way of saying automatic movements in people's body that are not deliberately obviously i'm deliberately moving my fingers now but in hypnosis i'll hypnotize people and their fingers will be twitching their arm will be moving their head will be nodding unconsciously or their eyelids will be fluttering all by themselves which is impossible to fake, fake. try and fake flutter your eyelids it's impossible to do uh, they're unconscious will communicate with me and um, we'll speed up the metabolism but we'll also go in there and make some shifts to that internal brain work or or mindware or software in their brain, take out that faulty programming uh, that's there and put in some new programs um, so they can train better, eat better, be healthier, uh, be happier with their body and with their health. So that's kind of like covering a little bit of all the things that I do. Well, it's not all the things, top four things. Um, top four things that I do anxiety, chronic pain, addictions, uh, and weight release stuff. But I do lots of other things as well. A client this week, little boy, a five-year-old, pee in the bed. Can't be at the size when I say close his eyes, doesn't want to close his eyes. When I say sit down, doesn't want to sit down. I say be quiet, he doesn't want to talk. So um, I have to find a different way of dealing with kids when I work with kids. And um, I've got inventive ways of, of working with kids because my old hypnosis ways wouldn't work because they're kids, they're already hypnotized. So I have to be the shyest object in the room, hence the tattoos and the rings. So when kids work with me... Uh, they're focused on me and I cannot make them shifts. But um, yeah, it's good working with kids and I'll just give that as an illustration of the story where I have to do different things to work with them and to help them. But um, unless you have some questions, I'm going to start wrapping this up right now. Um, but if you do have some questions, I'm going to be here for about another 10 minutes. But as always, um, if you're interested, if you've got something you want to work on, um, then underneath my name here, it says go here to book your free screening call. Click on the uh, little hyperlink right there. It should be uh, under the comments or the top of the comments. And you can book your free screening call with me. Opportunity for you and I to talk about an issue that you want to overcome. To strategize some ways to overcome it, to get rid of it once and for all. And to take your life to the next level. But unless you have any other questions, I'm going to sign off right now. Uh, I believe this video should be up on the uh, Leukonosis Hypnosis page, so you can watch it back uh, if you want to get some points there. Um, but as always, always believe. And have a great rest of your evening. Bye, Deb. Bye, Tara. Bye, Hypno Pixie.